here. Uh, my name is Jay Hershey. I live here in Westfield. And like our speaker tonight, Bob Haggerty, I work at the Wall Street Journal. And before I introduce Bob, I just wanted to say a word or two about our colleague, Evan Gershkovich, a Wall Street Journal reporter who is imprisoned currently in Russia. Uh, any attack on the press anywhere in the world is an attack on everyone's freedom. And everyone should take this very seriously. Uh, efforts are being made to secure his release. No one knows how long that's going to take. So please keep Evan in your thoughts. And uh, I have a few buttons left that I can distribute to people who would like to wear one. So uh, without further ado, uh, I was trying to think of a segue that would lead gracefully to introducing Bob. And Bob is actually a hero of mine at the Wall Street Journal. He has, he's a dedicated reporter. He's been a reporter 40 years, Bob? At least. Both of his parents were journalists. So we were just talking about this last night, about what, what led us to become journalists. And for Bob, it's truly a lifelong calling. He was one of my first bosses in Brussels. I think we can say that, can't we, Bob? So we've known each other a very long time, and I was thrilled that he has written this book. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce Bob and let him tell you all about it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jay. You've always been a great friend and a great colleague at the Wall Street Journal. You put up with all my whining, and uh, <laughs> I'm grateful for that. So I'm going to show everybody a picture of you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is Jay on a morning stroll with a few of his best pals. Um, and I figure when Jay finally gets around to writing his life story, he's going to explain what that was all about. <laughs> And thank you all for coming out tonight. I know that when it comes to reading, you have many choices. For instance, some of you may be tempted by the new Paris Hilton book. <laughs> but unless you've appeared naked all over the internet, I can assure you that my book will be more relevant to your life. <laughs> uh, before I get started, I'd like to just make two points. Uh, and one is that when I say obituary, I really mean life story in general. Uh, I don't just mean some little note, uh, because if we were just going to write a little note, we wouldn't really have to worry about that. But I think people should do more than that. Um, and I also want to say that everything I say about telling your own story applies to helping other people tell their stories, because sometimes people need a little bit of a nudge and a little bit of help. I was not always an obituary writer. Uh, I've been at the Wall Street Journal for more than 40 years and covered many things, including real estate and manufacturing and financial markets. And when I was writing about those things, uh, I'd sometimes call up big shots, and they wouldn't even return my messages. But since I started writing obituaries, some of those same big shots are dying to have me write about them. <laughs> so you got to think ahead. Um, over the past seven years, I've written more than 900 obituaries for the Wall Street Journal. And usually when I write an obituary, I try to talk to the adult children, if there are any, of the person who has died. And I'm always struck by how much these survivors want that life story to be preserved and how little they actually know about it. And that's why I tell everybody, tell your own story in short or long form. Don't leave it to family or friends who are almost certain to make a hash of it. <laughs> Did any of you ever tell stories to your kids or friends about your life, interesting stories, fascinating things have happened? 
Did, do you notice whether they were taking notes? <laughs> or did they maybe, just before you got to the punchline, check their phone? <laughs> so they're interested, and they'll try to remember your stories, but there's nothing like the original version. Um, and your story, with its ups and downs and joys and sorrows and the lessons you've learned, may be the greatest gift that you ever give to friends and family. And it's a gift that only you can give. I really love obituaries, even though I find that many or most of them are inadequate. Do, do many of you read obituaries? <laughs> Have you ever noticed that uh, when they died, they were always surrounded by family. <laughs> and I always wonder, why were they surrounded? I mean, was the family afraid that they might leap out of their deathbed and make a break for the door? <laughs> Another thing, they, always, they were always devoted above all to family. But what about the people who hated their families? <laughs> you never read about them. But I don't want to talk only about obituaries because I think people should do two things, really. One is to maybe write a little note that could be used to someday to announce your death in a newspaper or on a website, get all the facts right. But then something a bit longer for friends and family and whoever might be interested. I really love this quote from uh, Jim Harrison. But if we aren't careful, death can steal our stories too. When I see these uh, notices, I always think, is that all? But for most people, that really is all. All you're gonna find out about them if you look them up 20 or 30 years from now. So someday, your story will be told. If not by you, then by somebody else. And if not in detail, at least in a short note like this. So the question is not whether your story will be told or not, but just whether it will be told well or badly. That's not me, it's my dad. When he died in 1997, we wrote an obituary about him, and we got the basic facts right but we failed completely to provide any inkling about his personality. We could have mentioned that he always wore a white shirt and tie, even when he was mowing the lawn, <laughs> and that he was amazingly patient about playing catch with his son, when really he would have rather been in the house sipping a drink and reading the latest Dick Francis thriller. Well, nowadays, I have questions for my dad. For instance, why did he decide to become a journalist? Did he just like the hat? <laughs> now it's too late to ask. That's my mom. She lives in Grand Forks, North Dakota, and she's a journalist too. I interviewed her when she was 79 years old, and I wrote about 25 pages on her life story. She wasn't gonna do it, so I did. And I figured it was time. She was 79 years old after all. How much more could happen? <laughs> well, quite a bit actually. <laughs> My mom, uh, she works for the Grand Forks Herald in North Dakota. She still does at age 97. Uh, but when she was 85, when she was 85, she wrote a review of the Olive Garden restaurant, which was finally reaching Grand Forks, North Dakota. And after this review came out, somehow people who wrote blogs noticed it. And they started writing clever little pieces about how odd it was that this grandmother in North Dakota had written a earnest, unironic review of a restaurant where no food snob would ever <laughs> dare be seen. Well, soon my mom was getting phone calls from reporters in New York, Minneapolis, even Fargo. And they all wanted to know 
how my mom felt about being mocked all over the internet. Well, she felt fine about it. But she explained to them, look, I've got to finish my column for tomorrow, and then I'm going to Bridge Club. I don't have time to read all this crap. <laughs> That's the exact quote. And that is when my mom went viral. <laughs> I sent her an email. I said, Mom, you've gone viral. And she said, what is, what's viral? Well, what happened was she got called to appear on all of the national TV shows, Good Morning America, uh, Anderson Cooper twice, Top Chef. She was so busy taping in New York that she had to turn down The Tonight Show. <laughs> and she even met Tony Bourdain, who wanted to meet my mom and really liked her and decided that she ought to have a book contract. Um, so he told his publisher that she would have a book contract. This is the book they put out. Um, the concept of this book is we'll give you two, 128 reviews of restaurants in Grand Forks, North Dakota, most of which closed decades ago. <laughs> and it didn't sound like the most promising concept to me, but what do I know? It's sold. So the point of all this is start early on your life story, in your 20s, and your 30s, while you still remember things. But be prepared to update. Most of us eventually will make arrangements for what's going to happen to our money and our real estate after we die. But what about our stories? Unlike money, they can never be retrieved once they're lost. When people die, if, if their stories aren't recorded or written down, they're just gone, gone for good. So why is it that so few people do write down these stories? Well, people have come up with a lot of reasons for that. One of them is they say, won't people think I'm conceited if I'm writing about my life? Absolutely not. You're doing something for your family and friends, whether that means hundreds of people or one or two. And people say, okay, but I'm not famous. Who would care? Well, that's a good question. After all, you're not Paris Hilton. <laughs> you're not even George Santos. <laughs> but you never know. Samuel Pepys wasn't famous. Anne Frank wasn't famous. How much poorer would the world be if they hadn't thought it was worthwhile to write down a few of their reflections? And as for my dad, if he had asked, who will care, I could have told him, I will care. Some people are writing for millions. When I write my story, I'm writing for maybe two or three. At a seminar on life stories a few years ago, I met a janitor. And he told me he was estranged from his sister, who was his only living relative. My sister doesn't know me, he said. I want her to know me. He was writing for an audience of one. And that was enough. Other people say, I'm too busy living my life to stop and write about it. What a great excuse. You have a fascinating life. You're just too busy to tell it. It's a perfect excuse. It doesn't work, though, because all you need to do is schedule 10 or 15 minutes, say, twice a month, to jot down the most interesting things that have happened to you. After a while, it adds up. And even a little is way better than nothing. Many people also say, well, I hate writing. But that excuse won't work. You can record your story. But if you do that, Make a transcript and annotate it to clarify stuff that may not be clear to people a generation or two from now. You could simply save some of your best social media postings and put them in a file called My Life. You could annotate your family photo album, explain who those people were and what they were doing. You could write somebody an email or a letter Tell them about something interesting that happened recently. Make their day and save a copy for yourself. 
If you, need a little, if you need a little nudge to get you started, there are all kinds of computer programs and apps that can guide you in telling your story. And don't worry if you don't have a big theme or an original message for the world. Most of us don't. Just write whatever you find interesting and let the story find its own shape. It could be 500 words, it could be 500 pages. Okay, you say, you convinced me now, but where would I even start? Well, if you're unimaginative, like me, you can just start at the beginning. Here's how I started. My mother gave birth to me around noon on a very cool and rainy day in Minneapolis. Then she smoked a cigarette. <laughs> and it all flowed from there. But you can start in the middle if you like, or at the end, and jump around in time. Some people I find just stack up a series of episodes, interesting anecdotes, in more or less random order as they occur to them. And then sometimes at the end they put a little life lesson for each of them. That's educational for the grandkids, can be entertaining. So what would you include? Well, some things you include is are really basic facts that other people might get wrong. Like your full name, including your middle name, even if you hated it and never used it. Your exact date of birth, where you were born, where you grew up, what your parents did for a living, how and why you got on a career path in life, a certain path. How and why you decided to get married or stay single. When you tell your story, don't just tell people what you did, but why and how. The good and the bad, and the lessons you learned. For me, to start with them when thinking about writing about somebody's life, I have three big questions. What were you trying to do in life? And why? And how did that work out? Try asking yourself that question, those questions at least a couple times a year, even if you're not writing them down. What are you doing? Are you on track to doing what you want to do? If not, it's not too late to improve the narrative. Little things also matter. Try to describe amazing events, funny things that happened. Definitely include some humor if you can. My motto is, if obituaries can't be fun, what's the point of dying? <laughs> so what am I going to throw in? Well, I'll talk about a job I had around age 17, 18 at Kmart as a stock boy. And on one of my first days, the manager came up to me and told me that he wanted me to assemble some bicycles and put them on display. And then he just walked away. And at that time, you couldn't look up a YouTube tutorial on how to assemble a bicycle. Uh, so I just had to kind of figure it out for myself. And after about half an hour, I had something more or less like a bicycle. The problem was I had five or six parts left over. <laughs> I had no idea where they would go. So I just threw them out. <laughs> the moral of that story is be careful where you buy your bike. <laughs> now, I also have to include some things I really don't like to talk about, some of the dumbest and weakest things I've done. I don't want to dwell too long on those episodes, but I want to provide a bit of explanation in case my kids ever wonder. They might learn some things that I should have known. I also want to include some of the strangest things that have happened to me. Like the time in the mid-70s when I was a college student and working for a photo lab at my university. And one afternoon, a woman called up and said she needed somebody to take publicity photos. She said her name was Diana Love. I'm not sure that was her real name, but she did performances at bars. So I agreed to take Diana's picture and then she explained that first she would have to take off her clothes. Well, I was 18 or 19 years old at the time, and this photo shoot did make me a bit nervous. But I earned $20 for it, and I impressed a few of my friends. 
At that time, I belonged to uh, the, the camera club in Grand Forks, my hometown. Uh, and we were invited every month at the camera club meeting to display the best pictures we've taken recently. <laughs> and, and most of the members of the camera club were middle-aged guys who would drive out into the country and take pictures of sagging old barns <laughs> or rusty agricultural equipment. It was very artistic stuff. And I entered my portrait of Diana. <laughs> well, guess who won the first prize in the photo contest that, that month? <laughs> Enough about me, though. Let's talk about Iris Westman. Admit it, you were thinking the next slide would have been Diana Love. <laughs> but I took Iris's picture, too. Iris chose to remain fully clothed. <laughs> she was 110 years old when we met. She had been a teacher and librarian and spent her whole life in North Dakota and Minnesota. And it was early 2016 when we met. At that time, uh, Donald Trump was in the news. So I asked Iris, what do you think about Donald Trump? And Iris said, well, I've heard a bit about him, but not enough to have an opinion. She had a lot more to say about another politician, Warren G. Harding, <laughs> who was in the White House, as you may recall, in the early 1920s. He may not have been a great president, Iris said, but he was awfully good looking. <laughs> Iris did not offer any secrets to living, to, uh, living a long life. You just sit back and it happens, she said. The Lord takes care of it, and he knows what he's doing. We should just sit back and let him do it. But I think Iris did have one secret for leading a long and happy life. She did not watch cable TV news. Instead, she listened to books on tape, history books, travel books. I don't need a lot of things going on, Iris told me. I can be quite content sitting here and looking out the window and not seeing anything. If you've ever been to North Dakota, you know, you know that feeling. <laughs> well, readers of the Wall Street Journal had never heard of Iris, but when she died in 2021, at the age of 115, I wrote her life story and it was one of the most popular stories I ever wrote. So you don't have to be famous to have a good story. Still, I wish Iris had written her own story because she could have done a much better job than I did. So tell your story. It isn't going to be perfect. You'll probably have to leave a few things out because they're just too embarrassing. You may misspell a few words, violate a grammatical rule or two, and you may never finish the project, but that's okay, because, as I said, a little is way better than nothing. Whatever you can do to explain yourself and share the lessons you've learned is a precious gift to friends, loved ones, and maybe even posterity in general. You can make people cry, and you can make them laugh. And when you're gone, they're going to need to do both. I'd like to leave you with a little cautionary tale about what can happen if you leave your story to somebody else. In North Dakota, we tell stories about Oli and Lena, who are sort of the uh, typical Norwegian immigrants of times past, very thrifty people. And the story is that when Oli died, Lena went down to the newspaper office and wanted to put an obituary in a paper. And she'd already written the whole thing. So she turned it to the editor, and it said, Oli died. <laughs> and the editor said, well, Lena, for the same price, you could have a few more words. <laughs> so Lena thought it over, and she said, boat for sale. <laughs> <laughs> my dog, Harper. I'm going to definitely write about Harper. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, now I'd like to hear from you, questions, comments, what your experiences are in uh, preserving stories.
Yeah, I think it depends on the person. Uh, I think those prompts are a great idea for people who just need to be prodded. Uh, it'll get them started. It's a nice gift to give somebody. Um, that's a good way. And there are many other types of apps that will do it in different ways. Uh, other people just sit down, start writing. You know, I think it would be a mistake to think I'm going to sit down for eight hours and write my whole story. It's better just to do it in short bursts when you feel like it. Maybe set a schedule. I'm gonna, on Saturday morning, I'm gonna do this from 9.30 to 10 for the next few months. And you'd be surprised how fast things add up. Uh, and you don't really have to have a plan. You should think about what you're trying to say before you write, but you don't have to have a structure. You don't have to have a theme. You can just get started. Yes? Well, uh, when you present it to the newspaper, you, what do you, and you're writing your own story, um, what do you say, like, um, by the time you read this, I have died? <laughs> that would be a lot of people use that as an opening line. That's good. Opening line. Um, you know, I don't think, you don't have to present it. Um, you just uh, make sure your family knows you've written something and where it is, and uh, encourage them to make use of it. They'll be very grateful that they don't have to uh, look up what your birth date was or how to spell your mom's name or all that stuff. Yes? What about selecting a photograph of yourself? Well, that can be tricky. Because uh, <laughs> people will criticize you because you put one in that was 30 years old. But uh, I think people just, when I write obituaries with people, I, I, ask, I often ask for a photo and I say, just any time in a person's adult life is fine with me. Doesn't, you don't have to look old. Uh, <laughs> And it, you should have a collection of pictures with really. it. I mean, you might have just one for some website or some newspaper, but you should do something more for your family and friends. You should include as many pictures as you can of yourself and your family at different ages. <coughs> and it doesn't have to be about just about you either. It can be your family. So, pictures are very important. Yes? Uh, well, most of them are in no position to complain, but <laughs> yeah, sometimes the relatives will complain uh, because uh, a lot of people don't understand the nature of a newspaper obituary. They think, oh, this is a tribute, uh, and it's only going to have the good stuff that happen. Um, you know, that, that's, the formula seems to be, and this extends to quite a few newspaper reporters, unfortunately, they think, oh, well, we'll just have a, a real quick uh, summary of the life, something that would be worthy of Wikipedia, two or three sentences. And then we'll have a lot of quotes from people saying how wonderful, how intelligent, how generous, et cetera, et cetera. And then something about the services. And that's what they want. Uh, and that might be satisfying uh, for the family in the moment, but I think there should be something left behind that really reflects your personality, you know, what you were trying to do, uh, what happened to you, what you thought about it. So yeah, sometimes people complain. But most, most of that they don't. Yes? Uh, Garrison Keillor told a Lena and Ollie story uh -huh. about when Ollie was dying. Uh -huh. And he's upstairs in the bedroom dying. And Lena's baking brownies. And the smell comes wafting up. And uh -huh. Ollie struggles down the stairs starts reaching for the brownies, and she says, Ollie, stop that. Those are for your memorial service. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thr th definitely thrifty people. <laughs> so yeah, you don't want to trust them to write your story. <laughs> uh, yes? Um, I don't know if you, you may not want to answer this, but have you written yours? Have I written mine? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, that's really sort of what led to this book, uh, because I, I started, you know, I, after doing this job of obituaries for a few months, I started telling everybody, you know, you should really write something down because your family is not going to do a proper job. Uh, and then I thought, well, I should put my money where my mouth is and start writing about my own life. 
And I started doing that, you know, an hour or so on a Saturday morning, and I mentioned it to Jay Hershey, uh, and Jay said, oh, why don't you write a story about, you know, writing your own obituary? And I didn't really think of it as my obituary, but I thought it was a good idea for a story, and it led to this book. Um, I have another quick question. Do you rank him the first person or the third person? About myself? Or, or like, do he write? Well, I write about other people all the time, so no, I, no, I was always in the third person. Not for you, but in general, when people write their story, do they write it in first person or in third person? You could do it either way. I think it's, if you're writing your own story, I think it's more natural right. to put it in the first person. But I mean, if, you, if you're doing a little note that's just going to be inserted in a paper, that would probably be in the third person. Although some people do it in the first person. But then when you're writing something more personal with your friends and family. <clears throat> yes, way in the back. How do you choose which obituaries you're going to write on, for, the, for a particular weekend? How do I choose them? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, as I like to say, I get up every morning, and I, my job is to get up every morning and look for dead people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not in my backyard, but on my computer. <laughs> I make coffee first, uh, and I just I go looking through uh, a uh, news service called Factiva at stories from all around the world that mention died or passed away, and inventor or founder, uh, because I'm, I'm, for the Wall Street Journal, I write about business people, um, and I just look for interesting stories. I, I don't care if the people are famous, and I don't really care if they did any you know, they won awards or have a really impressive resume. I just want a good story. And sometimes there, there will be people who have had very high positions and have won awards and given away money, uh, but I don't really want to do the story because they never gave an interview, they never wrote down anything <coughs> about themselves, and so there's just very little to say. You know, you could just do a notice like this, uh, but that's not really what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to tell an interesting story that other people will want to read. Yes? Uh, there are news, newspapers are, I wouldn't say dying, but they're, they're certainly changing and retracting, and there are fewer and fewer newspapers that are doing what you do, mm -hmm. writing obituaries. Mm -hmm. More and more are those death notices that you, you posted, right. and most of those are paid advertisements by the word. Yeah. which prefer, which would lead to not a whole lot. Uh, are we suffering from kind of the, the an extinction of, of, of obituaries? Yeah, I think in a way, uh, yeah, when I was young, newspapers would really write an obituary about everybody in town who died. Mm -hmm. uh, they would take notes from the funeral director and they'd write up something. And if it was somebody at all prominent, they would write a real story. But then newspapers had fewer and fewer reporters and decided they didn't have time for that, and I discovered at the same time, hey, we could make a lot of money by charging people for these, and they, they can write them themselves. So, and some people are very creative and do a great job. Most people don't really, because, you know, when somebody dies, you've got a lot to take care of, you're upset, you don't have time to really think it over. So that's, I think, why <coughs> most people don't get a very good send-off. Um, and it's why I think people really should think about how they would like to be remembered and, and do it right. Yes? Bill, you said earlier in, um, that you like to talk to the adult children of the deceased. Mm -hmm. Do you ever get, do they ever give you a, uh, writings from the person who died that you use as source yes. material? Yes, yes, very often. And my first question is always, did he or she write something or record an oral history? Uh, and it's surprising, quite a few people do it, even people who are not at all famous. And many of these are really interesting. Uh, and they tend to be pretty honest or, or frank about admitting at least some of their mistakes. Uh, whereas if you ask the family, they want to just not mention anything that ever <laughs> went wrong. They want it to sound like you're writing an, a nomination for sainthood. <laughs> which is really pretty boring to read. <laughs> it doesn't give you any, you know, the real story is better. So it's a shame. Yes? So you get up in the morning, you find out this person died, and the publisher, the newspaper wants it 
filed by what, 10 o'clock that night? Well, so can, can you talk about the fact that these are, uh, you write these under some pressure? And maybe also you mentioned that for really famous people, maybe there's a rough draft. How does that oh, work? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, for, for famous people, we have done an advanced obituary most, almost all the time. Uh, when John Glenn died, we had not, so I had to really rush that one out. But normally there's something done. So I don't do that many famous people because I'm filling a space in the weekend edition of the Wall Street Journal, and it's about business people. And then you don't have three famous business people dying every week. And if Bill Gates died on a Monday, we're not going to wait until Saturday. So I'm looking just for interesting stories. So, and it doesn't matter if I write it today or a week from today. I, I can't write it a month or two months from now, but I, I can take a few days. So that's how it, it works. Yes? Actually, uh, I have a question about how do you suggest us not to get in trap? Because when we tell a story, we tend to uh, justify what we did, what our perception of our success or failure mm -hmm. is driven by my own narrative something, which doesn't, uh, the, 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 the coincide with exactly what happened in reality. So from the journalist's jam, perspective and uh, the experience, how do you suggest us not to get in that trap? Yeah, that is I may write beautiful stories because I have audience in mind, right. my family, for example, or, <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a good point. I mean. Obviously, when you're, you're talking about yourself, telling something that happened long ago, sometimes you just forget, and, and you stories evolve over the years. And some things you get wrong, and maybe some things you just lie about. Uh, but uh, I just suggest people do their best. You, you, your version of your story is not going to be perfect, but it's going to be a lot better than your friend's version of your story. And a good way to try to inject a bit more reality into it will be to have some of your friends or family read it and say, is, is this what you, how you saw it, or what do you think? And what would you say about what happened? And that way, it could become a better uh, record of your life. It's quite a challenge to ourselves. Right. Uh, but, how but, honest are, am, am I going to Yeah, be? yeah. But you, you can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. You've got to, you should do something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you probably, you probably got a great story, so uh, do start, don't, don't worry about philosophical questions. Just yeah. start writing and do it the best you can. And ask for some help from other people, yeah. if you can. Thank you. Yes? Could you pick important dates, important events that happened in your lifetime, and think about you know, what your story was related around those events, like 9-11? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, you should pick out the, the, the parts of your life that you thought, think are the, were the most uh, pivotal in decide, determining what you did with your life and the most interesting, the things you want to write about and think about and explore. Uh, you don't have to cover everything. Um, you know, if you try to record everything, I'm just going to get really boring for you and the reader. But almost everybody has had some interesting experiences. Uh, and if you start writing about them, you'll probably see some connections to other things that happened to you, and you'll, you'll remember other things. So it's something that just kind of develops as you work on it. You, you'll probably start out thinking, I don't have too much to say, really. But you might surprise yourself and find out, well, I had a lot more to say than I thought. Yes? So I'm curious if you might address the difference between memoir and telling your own story in this way, because I... I tend to think much more in um, the subjective, right? All of our stories, we have a subjective lens, but just, I think perhaps where you were going. So if you're writing a memoir, or you're writing about things that happened to you, you might be filtering it through that certain perception mm -hmm. versus, sorry, um, straight facts. Yeah, um, yeah. I did. I just say life story because there, there are all these terms you could use, autobiography, <laughs> memoir, obituary. They're all about lives. I mean, memoirs tend to be 
things where you maybe focus more on one important theme or event. It might be something that's commercial that you, you hope to sell to people, but um, you can call it whatever you want. Just to I guess I'm, I'm trying to get to the, um, the role of subjectivity, right? And, yeah, I and, mean, you and filtering experience through, you know, how do you filter experience and describe experience versus just facts? Yeah, well, you're never going to be able to write objectively about your life. Uh, but I think you should make the effort to make it as factual as you can and question your memories and question, you know, this is how I've always thought about it, but is that really true? Uh, you know, <coughs> talk to other people who were around and see what, what they thought about it. Uh, it. Admit when you're writing something that, you know, this is how I recall it, you know, and, and maybe it's colored by this or that, but uh, this is what I thought. This is what mattered to me. Yes? What if he's lived a double life? <laughs> <laughs> well, that'd make a better story. <laughs> you, you probably have some shocking revelations. Two stories. Two stories. All right. Yes? I read a lot of obituaries, and I'm always fascinated by uh, the amazing lives that so many people seem to have led very long obituaries, and they you know, visited three continents, eight countries, they had five children, they coached every kid's game, they attended every sporting event, they attended 20 charities, and I binged them, and I think, well, I must be the world's biggest loser. <laughs> <laughs> what did I do wrong? I, I have nothing that even parallels anything that these people have done, so I wouldn't even know what to say. Yeah, you might be surprised, though. Um, I mean, when I wrote, I, I sort of started writing all, everything I could remember that I thought was interesting, but then I also wrote for my book, uh, just as an experiment, a, a shorter obituary to try to summarize how my life could be summarized. And when I got done, I thought, gee, uh, I better do a few more good deeds to make this <laughs> <laughs> I better win some big prize or something. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm sure you've got a good story. <laughs> I'm sure there's some interesting things that have happened to you. And it doesn't have to be 500 pages. Yes. Yeah. I, I mostly read uh, these obituaries in the New York Times, and I notice they frequently have a similar format where the first half of it will be some kind of summary of why this person's famous and what they did, and then there's a break and it says they were born, and so and so, and, and, and why do they do that? <laughs> well, I, I tend to do that too. Um, I think the reason they do it is that uh, they want to explain at the top why do we think this person is notable. And then they want, at some point, give you a sense of how things developed in their lives. Uh, and I sometimes find that uh, with people who have done a lot of amazing things, that top part tends to be bigger. Right. But I find some other people, they, they maybe had only done one or two things that you consider notable, but they've just had a really fascinating chain of events that has led them to do whatever they did. And wow. so I put that the narrative part where it's all in chronological order, I make that longer. Um, and I think one thing that I dislike about most obituaries is they tend to just gloss over the first 20 or 30 years of people's life in a few sentences. But to me, that's usually the most interesting yeah, part. Interesting. How, did, how did they get started on something? How did they choose to do this or that? And what obstacles did they have to overcome? And how did they do it? And what did they think about it? So I think that's often missing, and it's partly because it makes you're the only one who knows that. Your kids don't know it, your friends don't really know it. So you can really help with that, uh, those early experiences. Thank you. Thank you. Yes? That's unclear. I have a, a few pages about the history of obituaries in my book, but I don't think that a lot about that is known. There's, there was one obituary written 
a few thousand years ago. I mean, it was just something inscribed in stone, and some people say this was the first obituary. <laughs> uh, I look back into newspapers, you know, three or 400 years back, and I found a lot of very brief obituaries. Some of them were kind of funny. Um, I think uh, the obituaries that we see today have sort of developed over the past 60 or 80 years, and I think a lot of influence has come from the British papers. My interest in writing obituaries came from reading London papers because they tended to do a really good job on making them entertaining and including the uh, scandalous parts and the funny parts and not being so reverent. Uh, and I thought that would be fun to do. And I, I think American papers have, uh, the, the few American papers that actually do write series of obituaries have sort of been Im influenced by that British style. Yes? I think you got to go back 20 years and read the local papers. I, I was just thinking of my mother's obituary, the one the kids put in, was facts and figures and the usual thing, and somebody at a local paper picked it up and said, hey, I know this woman, and her obit lead was, she was a wife and mother, and she got half of the page above the fold for the rest of the story. And it was all the, the stuff. And we kids didn't know it because the reporter, like you, went out and interviewed her friends. And I was like, I didn't know she was that. The second line of it was, was she raised her kids as um, uh, ABD PhD because all the boys but David were overseas. <laughs> so my mother just kept going to school. Mm -hmm. But and that was a fact that her three younger kids didn't know. The three older kids did, but the three younger kids had never heard about it. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to do that for a neighbor. So my question is, where do we start? If we're interviewing somebody who's still alive, what prompts should we do? I've got a fabulous neighbor who's lived in town for 95 years, and I love her stories. Yeah, well, I, I've had that wonder about that because sometimes I've written advanced obituaries on people, and I, I do want to call them up and say, I'm writing about you uh, <laughs> because uh, you've got a lot of information. I don't want to. Uh, Make them, make them think that I'm eager for them to die soon. Uh, I, I need something for Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just, I, I always uh, start out by saying, you know, we expect and hope that you're gonna be with us for a long time to come, but someday when you die, you know, newspapers are gonna write about you and uh, we wanna make sure we get it right. So could we have a chat about that? And most people welcome that. Now, if it's somebody not famous, you just have to explain you know, I think your life is so interesting, and I bet your friends and family would like to know more about you, and why don't we try to write down some of this stuff uh, and put it together so that it'll be a gift to your friends and your grandchildren or whoever. Right. Most people would like that idea. Yes? You ever run across people who don't want advanced publicity? Because I've noticed a couple times recently someone tells me, oh, someone died. And usually you can go and type in blah, 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 obituary and something comes up, like a funeral home visit or something. But sometimes I never do find that. And I'm wondering if some people do not want their death publicized. Yeah, I think they, that does happen occasionally. Um, I'm not sure why. Uh, Very private. <laughs> yeah. Yeah some, yeah, some people just are extremely private and they don't want anybody prying. And it, you know, if, if you don't if you don't want it to be written about, uh, don't say anything and don't leave a, a record behind. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obituaries are kind of unfair in a way because uh, for most of us, the bad things we have done are not really known generally. So when people write a story, all they can do is talk about the nice things they know about us. But if you're if you've done something wrong. Uh, and had been uh, dragged through court or <laughs> convicted of something, then that is going to be the focus. Yeah. And you might actually be a pretty good person compared to somebody else who just got away with everything. Uh, but uh, those are the breaks. Uh, but I mean, I think if you want this, if you want a story that's going to be accurate, you're going to have to contribute to it. Somebody else, you have an audience that you know, in the newspaper. When, if you know, we are going to write a 
Yeah, well, I mean, when I'm writing, you know, I, I'm trying to think, well, what would readers who don't know this person, what would they want to, want to know? What would they find interesting? But, you know, if I'm writing for my grandchildren, I'll think, you know, what might they like to know about me? What would they find interesting? What would I like them to know? What, what, do, they, what do people misunderstand about me? Um, and what do I, maybe, what... Who do I want to thank for helping me along the way? Uh, what what lessons do I have that might be valuable for? So the audience shape the story. Yeah, you, you should be thinking about it. the reader. You know, what would be interesting to them? Um, yes. In your professional obituary writing, what was the most challenging obituary in terms of actually getting? You know, I'd really have to think about it. I've written so many, and they all kind of blur together in my mind, because uh, you, you get very deeply into this project, and then the next week you got three more people. Um, there, there have been some people I just can't track down anybody in their family or, or anybody who will talk about them. I just have to give it up. Uh, I can't really say offhand which one has been the hardest, but. Have you had ones where there's like completely bifurcated views of the person, you know? Sometimes. I had one where the, a family member was very eager for me to write an obituary about somebody who had died in sort of mysterious circumstances. And uh, I got to wondering, do they just want to uh, collect some insurance money on somebody? Because this is all, and I, I thought none of this could be verified and uh, I'm just not going to do this. <laughs> um, well, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate you coming out. Uh, if, you, if you like a book, I've got copies here for the special Westfield Library, low price of $20. Um, and.